How do we manage the protein transition? Which food components can provably boost your immune system? What's the best way to validate health claims for food and food components? Listen to our food and health experts discuss the biggest questions facing the food, nutraceutical, and food ingredient industries today. Welcome to Niso Talks Food and Health. Alternative methods of producing proteins offer exciting opportunities for creating vegan alternatives to animal-based products and ingredients. Some of these even promise to create animal proteins without the animal. But with the high cost for development and production, how can you be sure you are on the right track? Emma Teuling, Project Manager Protein Technology, tells about the hurdles of making techniques such as precision fermentation feasible. Alternative methods for producing proteins for making vegan alternatives to animal products uh, offer great opportunities. Precision fermentation is such a technology, but there are many hurdles that need to be overcome for, for making such technologies feasible. Today I'll be speaking to Emma Teuling, she's Project Manager Protein Technology at NISO. Emma, welcome. Thank you. So, um, these type of new technologies, but um, uh, maybe you can explain a bit what are the different approaches to making alternative proteins? Yeah, of course. So, what we see in making, um, let's say, alternative products to, to dairy, uh, or sorry, to, to animal-based products such as dairy products, meat, egg, etc., is that you, you often use proteins from plant-based sources, traditional way to do so. Yeah. Uh, so soy, pea, etc. And what we see more recently is that uh, people also use proteins from cellular sources. So this can be just the whole biomass, but it can also be precision fermentation, where we actually make proteins from an animal source, but without using the actual animal. So that's producing a, a, a protein which is similar to the protein produced by the animal in this case. Yeah, so the aim of precision fermentation, if we, for example, focus on dairy here, is that you can make, let's say, a casein molecule with the exact same amino acid profile, uh, the, same, um, uh, the same sugars, minerals, etc. attached as the original molecule that you can find in cow's milk. And thereby it can have the same properties as the original casein from cow, but you don't use the cow, so it's a vegan alternative to casein. So what are the specific advantages of uh, uh, precision fermentation proteins? Yeah, so if you would compare precision fermentation proteins to the more traditional plant-based proteins, uh, there's a very clear advantage. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to use, or if you want to make uh, an analog for dairy, for example, and you want to make this from soy-based proteins, you will always find that the ingredient is so different that it needs a lot of processing and tweaking to get close to that dairy alternative, but uh, to that original dairy product, I mean. But still, you will find that it's different in, in taste, flavor, nutritional profile. Yeah. Whereas if you would actually have the same ingredients that are in a cow's milk, um, but without the cow, but these ingredients are the same, they are molecularly the same, and you can imagine that you can also expect to have the same texture and, and the same flavor and the same nutritional properties and, and, and safety, perhaps, as the original product would have. So that's, that's a very clear advantage. And next to that, um, the aim of precision fermentation or another aim would be that it would also use less arable land and less resources than the traditional plant-based sources. Uh, but we're not currently there yet. So could you explain a bit what the challenges are of developing products with precision fermentation? Um, yeah, so at the moment, uh, the main challenge would be, um, or there's two main challenges. One of them would be uh, the, the costs involved. You would need um, large-scale fermenters, you would need specific media, uh, but also downstream processing, of course. But Because once you have a, a, a yeast or a fungus that, that can create such a casein molecule, for example, you yeah. still need to make sure that you can purify this from your source. Um, and next to that, um, once you have your, your, your casein molecule, to come back to that, you still don't have all the ingredients that you need to make a dairy cheese. Of course, a complex, or well, a cheese is of course a very complex matrix of all these different components, not only various types of proteins, but also carbs and lipids and minerals, and they all need to be together in the right ratio to make that final product. So having that one casein molecule uh, is not enough to make that final dairy uh, product. No, so I can 
I can understand. So that, that there, there are many challenges ahead. Uh, if we look at, at, at testing, uh, um, that, that, that's critical for developing precision fermentation protein. But why is, why is early testing so, so uh, essential? Yeah, as I, as I just mentioned also, uh, there are large costs involved. Mm -hmm. um, so you can imagine that if you spend all your resources on um, building a process to make this, uh, this casein molecule, for example, um, you need to scale this up to have enough material to, to finally make that cheese and to then only learn that it's not working, that some, somewhere something went wrong in your process or in your approach. You can imagine that that's yeah, very, very uh, uh, costly. Yeah. Um, so if you can test your, your ingredient early on, earlier on in the process to see whether it has the right functionality, for example, um, yeah, this, this can really help you to steer in the right direction. Yeah. No, that, yeah, okay, so I can imagine that so, so costs are, are really important here. Um, but but uh, if, if you elaborate a bit on the cost, how, how can the cost of development then be reduced? Yeah, so if you have a tool, for example, that you can already analyze functionality and, and, and application possibilities using a very, very small amount of that protein, of that very costly protein, yeah. of course, this will help a lot. So something that... that, that can be done on very small scales, um, measuring whether your protein is soluble in water or whether it has gelatin capacities or other yeah. technofunctional properties. But once you want to understand texture and, and flavor and perhaps nutritional uh, um, digestibility, for example, of this, of this uh, molecule in a final product, you do need larger quantities usually yeah. to test this. Yeah. And you said uh, so testing with with small amounts is, uh, is is important, but how can you test with only a small amount of protein? Um, yeah, so at NISO we actually um, have micro food models, mm -hmm. uh, and one example of that would be the micro cheese model, where we can use um, yeah a little bit over over one milliliter uh, to make uh, different types of cheeses, um, and. We can screen using those small volumes. We can already screen for different textures and flavors and different kind of attributes very, very early on in your development stage because we require very, very little of that precious protein that you developed. Yeah. And such models, are they validated? Because I think you want to make a step to reality. Yeah, they are validated at least for, for cheese and yogurt, for example. So it really depends on the final product application. Okay. Well, Emma, I think you showed us, uh, uh, gave us a nice insight into the long way for developing uh, proteins via techniques like precision fermentation. Early testing is essential to keep costs in hand, and you want to have tests at hand which are already uh, um, uh, implicate what in reality might happen. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this was Nisa Talks Food and Health, and if you want to know more, please check out our website. Thank you.